Um, recording in progress. So welcome everyone to City Wildlife's um, webinar series. We haven't done one of these in a while, but we're, we're gonna have a very special and good one tonight. So welcome back to those of you who have joined us before. And, um, and to those of you who are new, special welcome to you. A um, couple of housekeeping things. These, these talks generally go 45, 50 minutes, um, always a little different, but then there'll be um, room for questions at the end. If you would keep yourself muted, that would help. Um, for questions, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat at any point, and I will go through them and sort of combine ones that are essentially the same question being asked by different people and feed them to our guest um, towards the end. But you can put them in the chat sort of as you go along and we'll catch up. But um, in the meanwhile, keep yourself muted so that we can all hear the speaker. And um, I'm about to introduce him, but first a big special thank you to our ASL interpreter, Mel Gardner, who joins us every time, making these talks accessible to an audience. Um, who we don't want to leave out. And so she works very hard. Um, it's exhausting work. We have to let her go when, um, when our time is up with great thanks. So thank you, Mel. Appreciate you being here as always. Um, and our speaker tonight, uh, Peter Paul Van Dyke, um, a man fascinated with turtles since he was a child, kept them and bred them through much of his formative years. That interest led him to study turtles in Thailand and as he did so, earning a degree from the National University of Ireland in Galway. And now he's technical advisor to the CITES Working Group on Tortoises and Freshwater Turtles, to the Turtle Conservancy, to the Turtle Survival Alliance, among others. Um, Peter Paul continues to carry out scientific research, including the annual updated checklist of turtles of the world, mapping the distribution and diversity of turtles across the globe, Altogether, he spent a quarter century doing turtle science and turtle conservation. And now, of course, comes the high point of his 25-year career when he gets to present a webinar for City Wildlife. But joking aside, um, I don't know that we've ever had such a very distinct, oh, we've had PhDs before, we have, but we're very glad to welcome you. It's really an honor. We appreciate you donating the time and your knowledge tonight. and. Um, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Peter Paul. Thank you, Jim. And thank you all for this invitation and for the opportunity to speak. I was asked to talk about um, Eastern box turtles and what we can do to help them survive in the mid-Atlantic region. So I put some slides together. I readjusted some stuff that I had and I added some new things. And so I'll take you through these. And when we have questions, I'll try to do my best to answer them. Let me try if this screen sharing stuff works. And then hopefully you see a pretty turtle now. Yep, that's good. Perfect. So I will try and talk my way through this. I'm not the world's greatest presenter, but uh, hey, it's I'm, I'm uh, among friends here and I love talking about turtles. So to just set the stage a little bit for the Eastern box turtle, um, when you're talking about turtles, it's tortoises, freshwater turtles, and marine turtles. Um, we, there's about 360 species of turtles worldwide, including seven marine turtles, about 60 tortoises, and the rest are focused on freshwater. And for a small group of animals, they're actually surprisingly widespread. They occur in all tropical, subtropical, and temperate regions of the planet every continent except Antarctica, and they occur in a really wide range of habitats from the deep sea and coastal areas to lowlands, into hills, rivers, streams, up to an altitude of probably two and a half thousand meters. So you're talking about 7,000 feet altitude, which is pretty high for a cold-blooded ectotherm animal. Where do the world's tortoises and turtles uh, tortoises, freshwater turtle species occur on the planet. As I said, mostly all tropical, subtropical temperate zones, but three areas of great um, species richness. Predictably, the tropical Americas, the Amazon basin, 
Southeast Asia, essentially from uh, Northern India through Bangladesh uh, and all the lowlands all the way into the Indonesia. But the third global hotspot of turtle richness is the Southeastern United States. And here in the uh, DC region, we are within date rate range of 12 different turtle species, which is amazing. There's not that many places on the planet that actually do that. Now, towards freshwater turtles, they all have a pretty consistent life history. They're all characterized by late maturity, late sexual maturity, usually at an age anywhere between five and 25 years of age or later. And that's the first time that they reproduce. They usually have great longevity, 10, 20, 50 years is expected. Some of the bigger giant tortoises uh, probably exceed a century without too much trouble. We don't really know too much about how old turtles can get because the turtles tend to live longer than the people that study them. And every so often when you hand over a study from one person to the next, there's always the opportunity to swap one turtle from another. And so even though, yeah, sometimes you have records of a, an, a tortoise on Ascension Island for 170 years, but that actually was a replacement tortoise, the second one. So some of the extreme long lived animals may actually be exaggerations, but there's still a lot to be research there. Either way, once turtles reach uh, an adult size and state, they tend to survive very well. They have like a 2% or less chance of annual mortality. Uh, so they live for decades. Um, that allows them to produce a lot of eggs or consistently produce a clutch of eggs every year for decades on end. And they have to do that because the, the annual number of eggs is pretty low. And again, it depends on the species. It goes from one in a couple of tortoise species, per, one egg per year per female, to sea turtles that say, may put out six, seven clutches of 100 eggs in a year, but then they usually skip the next year altogether. Uh, but even that, if you compare that to fish or a lot of other species, that's not great numbers of offspring propagules. And then most of the eggs, a lot of the nests are detected and predated. Uh, those eggs that do survive um, and the hatchlings emerge, the hatchlings will spend the first couple of years trying to outrun predation and environmental disasters, droughts, floods, um, uh, extreme temperatures and so on. What it all does it is it all adds up to quite low resilience to mortality of adult turtles. Um, turtles essentially are have designed a life history that is focused on great losses of eggs and hatchlings and juveniles, but then very long survival and persistence of the adults. And if you as humans start messing with excessive mortality of the adults, then you short circuit that whole life history and you bring a population down. Um, the diagram here is trying to illustrate these different factors that turtles have dealt with for millions of years, something like 200 million years, million years um, in natural ecosystem balances. You have a female, she produces a clutch of eggs. Let's say that one of them hatches. Take several years to grow and then a long reproductive output, uh, a long reproductive life. Most of the clutches are discovered and predated, but occasionally a clutch escapes and hatches and so on. Um, then the hatchlings have to run the gauntlet of the predators. But again, some of them will make it through and eventually grow to be their own. But it takes a long time, it takes decades. And so, Turtle populations are quite delicate in the sense that once they are disturbed and depleted, it takes a long time to recover. So the Eastern box turtle, we've probably all seen them uh, uh, as we're walking around in parks and so on. Um, it's one of those species that's very hard to predict with certainty where you're going to find it, but you can come across one 
treatable anywhere, anytime in decent weather. It's a widespread species. The distribution map here on the right shows where the three uh, North American subspecies occur. The Eastern typical box turtle subspecies ranges all the way into the Michigan Peninsula and up to the Mississippi. It's got a wide range throughout the Mid-Atlantic, goes just about into New York State and then along the coasts uh, and then all the way down through the Carolinas uh, and lowlands all the way into Florida where we get the different subspecies. So it's a widespread species. It's a inhabitant of open vegetated disturbed areas, think forest edge, think riverine, riparian areas, think tree fall areas, and they can wander for substantial distances. So they easily colonize uh, newly available areas. So you would think that's pretty bulletproof species in its survival outlook. But unfortunately, no, not really. Uh, the IUCN did an IUC, uh, a red list evaluation of the species uh, chances or prospects for survival and came to the conclusion that it actually qualifies as vulnerable, which roughly means a 30% chance of extinction in the foreseeable future. And to break down uh, those criteria, um, I don't know how many of our audience here are familiar with the IUCN red list criteria, um, but it's listed, the Eastern box turtle is listed as vulnerable under the criteria A2 BCDE plus four BCDE. Now that is alphabet soup to most people, but there is a reason to the, there's reason to the madness. Uh, the criteria A simply means that it's a reduction in population size over three generations of the species concerned. So in this case, the species, the generation time for the Eastern box turtle is estimated to be at least 17 years. So three generations is taken as 50 years. And then in the case of a 30% or greater reduction of total population size of mature animals, uh, it qualifies as vulnerable. Then the numbers two and number four mean that uh, in the case of two, it means the reduction or across those three generations occurred in the past, but has not ceased. And four means that the reduction occurred in the past and is expected to continue into the future for at least one more generation. And then the BCDE is the actual causes of that decline. And B is the index of abundance that is appropriate to the taxon. And that is a fancy way of saying uh, survey indications. Um, if you go out surveying now and you find 100 and you come back and you survey 10 years later and you find only 70, that's, re that's an indication of 30% decline if the survey effort was the same, et cetera, et cetera. So that is an index of abundance. We cannot, like African elephants, count every single turtle in the landscape, but we can have an indication of how many there are per square mile or any other um, uh, index. Then letter, the small letter C is a decline in the area of occupancy, i.e. Um, do they occur in all the areas where they previously occurred? The extent of occurrence, which is essentially has the overall range, the distribution range shrunk for the species, or the quality of habitat. Uh, and quality of habitat can say, simply be converting suitable habitat into unsuitable habitat, whether it's residential estates or whatever, agricultural intensification. But it can also be the um, construction of a road nearby, which then leads to an increase in um, road mortality of animals that uh, try to cross the road. So it doesn't have to be the entire habitat to be destroyed it, or affected. It can just be selective uh, changes with uh, wide ranging consequences. Then Small criterion D is the actual or potential levels of exploitation, essentially in the case of this species, pet trade, either in the past or at present. 
Uh, and at the moment, the species is protected, legally protected in most of the state where it occurs. There's some take for personal use, i.e. pets permitted in a few states. Um, it is listed on CITES Appendix 2, so the theoretically international trade is limited by regulations. And the track record has been that export permits are unlikely to be issued to, for wild collected animals. But there's still also the, uh, the impact of potential illegal trade. And as some of us know, Eastern box turtles have become particularly um, popular in some sectors of the international pet trade. And then finally, E, little uh, criterion E, is the effects of introduced taxa, invasive species, but it also includes um, subsidized predators, for example, but also hybridization, pathogens, pollutions, competitors, or parasites. It's a, a mixed bag of whatever else can affect the species. So I don't really want to, <laughs> to draw, to spend too much time on uh, all the the disasters that are happening to uh, turtle populations and wildlife at times. But so I want to focus on what we can do to lessen the impact of things like habitat loss and degradation, vehicle mortality, illegal collection, predation, disease, and other harm. So that's what I'm trying to focus the rest of this, uh, this presentation on. And I apologize for a few unpleasant pictures coming up. But yes, this unfortunately is a major impact just road mortality as turtles try to cross a road to get from one place or another. Sometimes the, these roads are put into areas where previously there were no roads or only very low traffic roads. The animals may have learned over the course of their life that there's good feeding in one area and good nesting in another. So they just move regularly across that road until someday it doesn't work out. So what can we do as humans? basically always drive carefully. If you see something on the road ahead of you, if it's in a rural area or wherever, um, just avoid it. Be careful. It, it may look like a leaf or a rock or a twig, but it could be a turtle, a frog, a snake, or some other wildlife. It also is bad for your tires to run over things. So that's a self-serving interest. But also small little thing that most people don't think about but if you live in an area where box turtles or other wildlife are, are likely to get into your garden or and onto your driveway check your driveway before you reverse out of the garage uh, you never know what's there and wherever it is just drive gently drive slowly if you need to be there on time just leave a few minutes earlier round over um, the other thing, yeah, don't support illegal pet trades and please don't take turtles or rescue turtles from the wild. They're probably quite okay where they are. If you see a turtle trying to cross the road or in the middle of the road, yes, if, if it's safe to do so, pull over, take it off the road and put it in the direction where it was going. But other than that, if there's a turtle in the wild, leave it in the wild. As I said, um, Eastern box turtles have become incredibly popular in the illegal trade in a few places, unfortunately. This is a picture of a cardboard box that uh, was intercepted at a courier facility somewhere in the United States. Every one of these objects is a box turtle wrapped in uh, a sock to keep them quiet and hopefully get shipped undetected. These ones were uh, detected and so then they had to be placed at the rescue facility and there's gonna be a long process ahead before these animals can either go back to the wild or uh, will spend their lives in captivity as, um, as awareness and educational animals. Um, as I mentioned before, um, a lot of turtle nests get predated. And of course, predation of nests, turtle nests, is a natural factor. It has happened for millions of years and will continue to happen for millions of years. But it's always a balance between how many turtles are there and how many predators are there. 
And one of the challenges we have in the last oh, decades, centuries in the developed world, certainly, is that we are subsidizing some adaptable predators uh, by providing food for raccoons or crows um, through the winter. Many More of them survive through the winter. So next spring, as the turtles are nesting, there's a greater population of natural predators and there's a greater impact on the number of turtle nests that get collected. So we're not going to do anything about that in the grand scheme of things, but certainly on a personal uh, level, uh, the less uh, trash can, gets exposed to the, uh, raccoons, to ravens, to crows, and other opportunistic scavengers and predators, the better the chances are for maintaining a natural Eco ecological balance and um, with that the better the chances for turtle uh, nests to hatch successfully and turtle hatchlings to survive to the next year. A special case of predation or at least molesting and harassing can be uh, dogs going around. Some dogs just are fascinated with turtles and just want to sniff them and then walk off. Uh, unfortunately, some dogs think that uh, turtles are a chew toy and can do substantial damage to a box turtle or another turtle, uh, potentially kill it, uh, or at least injure and scar and stress it. So, again, what do we as wildlife friendly humans uh, do? We have to keep our dogs uh, under control. Um, most of the area here has a leash law, law for dogs anyway. Uh, just be aware of it, even when off leash were permitted. Uh, just make sure that they don't harm animals. And that includes potentially uh, turtles wandering into a fence backyard where dogs uh, reside. Um, personally, I like just doing park cleanups, just go into the park, clean up the trash. It just looks better and it reduces the chances of some animal uh, getting tangled in there, getting um, may, polluting the park, visual uh, uh, issues. I don't know if turtles benefit much from park cleanups. Uh, I've never detected any sense of aesthetics among turtles, but certainly, uh, any plastic bag taken out of the environment is one less plastic bag that a, a wild animal can get uh, entangled in and suffocate from. Um, and then obviously parks and other uh, public areas, they need to be maintained, but at the same time, that maintenance sometimes does damage to some of the wildlife. Um, in the park be behind my house here, Every spring, contractors come through and mow the verges, the margins of uh, the walking trails. And they want to do a really good job, we only want to do it once or twice. So they set their mowers really low and they just shred everything. Unfortunately, what you see at the left here is what happens to uh, box turtles uh, that happen to be in that tall grass beside the path. Uh, they don't survive it. So if there is an opportunity uh, for park service staff, for contractors, or even farmers who are mowing lands for hay, mow at least four inches off the ground, preferably six inches. That's even better. Uh, in the case of uh, farmers making hay, it's actually better to, uh, to mow that higher because the nutritional value of the first, the lower four to six inches is really not particularly good in grass. Uh, the higher cut actually it reduces the total volume of hay a little bit, but the quality is much better. And then sometimes you have a massive development project uh, happening in habitat that was really good for box turtles. Most of us probably remember the construction of uh, the intercounty connector, Maryland 200 over the, in the Northern suburbs, uh, up north of DC in Maryland. On the lower right, you see an image of construction of part of the intercounty connector. And you see the orange fencing there. That was the turtle fence that was constructed all the way along 
uh, the work site. And for three years, a group of volunteers uh, organized by the Humane Society went in there on weekends and looked for turtles, looked for box turtles and eva to evacuate them. Most of them were moved to Patuxent Wildlife Research Station. Some of them went to other areas. Um, so a lot of efforts, about 900 box turtles were moved into safe areas, um, which was fascinating, which was really good. It made us all feel very good. Unfortunately, we also discovered something very concerning after that. Some of these animals that were translocated had been tele, um, transmitted with telemetry transmitters and were fo being followed by students. And we discovered that some of these animals were looking good one day. You come back three days later, they're looking sick, like severe cold, flu-ish, snotty noses, trouble breathing. And you come back another three days later and they're dead. This was an outbreak of Rana virus that went through the mid-Atlantic states around 2012, 2014. Uh, and it was quite fatal. We still don't quite know how it transmitted, how it will spread. It doesn't appear to be as severe now in its impact as it was at that time. Maybe it has, the worst has passed, we don't know. Uh, but certainly um, the, the risk of disease is quite severe and quite concerning. And all these, it, it feels good to move animals around into safer places, but we need to be really careful that we don't accidentally create another problem. And we don't know if we created a problem or if the random virus would have swept through anyway. And we just noticed that it happened because we were following telemetered animals. But either way, um, these things need to be done with great safeguards and monitoring. And so far I've been talking about public lands and it's gen public lands is generally the primary conservation uh, focus. It's national parks, it's wildlife refuges, it's uh, other protected areas. Um, we're making progress with towards the 30 by 30 goal, protecting 30% 30 of the planet's land surface by 2030. But there's a lot of land that's not available. And even if we get to 30%, it will be very unevenly spread. Uh, some areas will have a lot of protected areas uh, and a lot high percentage of protected lands. Other areas, despite having great conservation value, there's very little protected land. Um, just at a glance uh, from these maps, you can see the vast areas of protected lands in essentially wilderness areas, Arctic, de Arctic tundra areas, uh, as well as enormous areas of uh, open ocean. Uh, whereas you look at um, Southeast Asia or even the central and eastern United States, it's not that much because too much of the land is already being used for other purposes and it cannot be reverted back to natural uh, protected areas. This just illustrates the challenge we have here in the United States. Um, the eastern and northeastern areas, there's vast um areas of land that are just all private land and so the opportunities for doc, uh, for protecting additional public lands are pretty slim so we have to look at that 60 percent of privately owned land and about 70 million acres or 3.6 percent of the united states is urban and that simple 3.6% 3, 3 of urban land surface. It actually is equivalent to the total wilderness area of the United States, and it exceeds the national parks and the state parks when you combine them. So there's large areas of private ur urban and suburban areas that theoretically could be used for biodiversity conservation. And of course, private land is partly agricultural, mostly agriculture and forestry, but it's also gardens and backyards. And in, for example, the United Kingdom, um, it's very much recognized that 10% of the land area, area is actual gardens. And they have, they're very clearly recognizing that for its significant biodiversity conservation value. 
So I believe that there's a lot to be gained in managing private gardens, backyards for biodiversity conservation, including eastern box turtles. In March 2012, Janet Marinelli wrote an article about private gardens as box turtle habitat. And that was an article that I got just before we all, um, bought a home ourselves here in the DC suburbs. And so that got me all excited about uh, starting um, thinking about gardening for in a turtle friendly way. So yeah, we bought a garden and a house to go with it uh, as far as I'm concerned. But, so my wife thinks about it the other way. So we are in the DC suburbs. This is what our area looks like when you fly into Dulles. Dulles is in the upper uh, left corner. Our house is somewhere in the lower right corner, just adjoining that uh, green patch of uh, trees and park here. It's a stream valley uh, park. It's a county park. And we like that quite much, quite a lot. So as we were moving in in summer 2012, we were greeted at the back deck by a box turtle sitting there. Well, we have bought the right house, obviously. But then instantly you get to the question, how do you manage a garden with wildlife, without harming the wildlife and without and pref preferably helping that uh, wildlife uh, and particularly the box turtles. So I think the, the first, first and foremost, uh, the rule was first do no harm. Um, and that is more difficult, that proved more difficult than it seemed uh, at first. Here, this box turtle clearly visible, but if you were to step a yard away and look from the side, you wouldn't even see it. And unfortunately, living in suburbia, the key thing is you must have a lawn. Usually, usually the homeowners association requires you to have a lawn and that lawn need, must be mown. So lawn mowing is always a scary thing for when it comes to turtles. Um, there's a couple of things that you can do to help at least. Um, most mowers are blade mowers but there is such a thing as a drum mower on the left here. That's always a hand pushed one, unfortunately, which is really arduous in a year Virginia or Maryland summer. But where you can, it's very much preferred. As you can see on the left, there is the drum mower actually has a bar at the front, which pushes objects out of the way. And then the glass, the grass is cut with a scissor action at the back of the mower. So the chances of harming a turtle are minimal. Whereas if you look at that horrible blade flying around like a aeroplane pro propeller on the right, yeah, that's bad news for a turtle. This is a turtle that had an extremely lucky escape with lawnmower probably. Um, you can see that part of the shell had just been shaven off uh, the top and the animal was just really lucky not to have been totally crushed and shredded. Then also, if you have to mow, well, you will have to mow, when you have to mow at some time and ideally for wildlife, the best time to mow is really during hot, dry weather at the middle of the day. That's the time when it is hottest and sweatiest to mow, but it's also when most of the wildlife has taken shelter elsewhere. Even the insects have gone down close to the ground level and you'll probably do the least amount of damage. You'll still kill a couple of grasshoppers and things, but less than uh, if you're mowing at, at the crack of dawn or in that lovely uh, late afternoon, evening uh, cool period. Of course, you always have to pre-check the area that you're going to mow. And as you're mowing one strip, watch the next one where you're going. There's, it's hard to figure out whether it's ideal to mow fairly high, like a couple of inches so that you have a lower risk of hitting something or low mow quite low down so that you can see what is there and start mowing again before it gets too high that you can no longer see what's uh, 
what is hiding in the grass. Um, I've tried both on balance. I think it's slightly safer to mow quite low and mow quite regularly so that whatever there is there is easily visible. Also, it makes the shorter grass less attractive for insects and other animals to hang out and spend too much time there. So you move them, essentially they move to other places and have a lower risk of getting run over by a lawnmower. And then another associated thing, if you can start mowing from the inside of the lawn and move outwards towards the edges, that actually pushes again whoever insects and other animals, snakes, whatever, are in that to the taller grass, it pushes them out to the edge where they can escape into flower beds or shrubbery or whichever. It works much better for the wildlife. Unfortunately, it is much more laborious to do. So I've talked with farmers about if they can do mowing from the inside out. That was a recommendation, for example, to save corn crakes, a rare breeding bird in meadows in Ireland. And the farmers always said like, we would love to do it, but it is so much more complicated and you run the tractor over so much unmown grass by doing that, that it's not worth doing. But we are not commercial farmers. We are backyard hobbyists and gardeners and we can make that extra effort. So if we can, please mow from the inside out. And then when you get to the edges, be extremely careful there because that is where animals are going to be hiding against obstructions, objects, raised beds, etc. Uh, so hand clipping of the last couple of inches is preferred or just leave it rough for the time being. And then also pull the mower behind you in areas where there's a higher risk of encountering something so that you stepping through the grass will chase animals out of the way and or you'll actually see it before the mower gets there. If you walk behind the mower, Nope, you, you can't see where you're going really. Also for responsible wildlife gardening management, I believe you have to avoid or at least minimize pesticides, herbicides, rodenticides. And I'm not a particular fan of chemical fertilizers either. I don't know how much of a difference it's gonna make, but personally, I would prefer to avoid them. So those are in the do no harm category. And then it's like, well, what can we do to make things even better? So then you start thinking about creating micro habitats. And first and foremost, a shallow pond or pool is wonderful. Animals can drink there, they can bathe there, they can restock their fluids. Uh, and as long as it has very gradual sites that they can easily get out without accidentally flipping over and drowning that way, um, a shallow puddle is a wonderful addition to any wildlife garden. You can also th start thinking about creating potentially nesting areas. I've thought about doing that, but uh, looking at what the box turtles are doing in the backyard here, they'll find their own spot. As long as you have a nicely varied garden with shady patches, sunny patches, mulch beds, flower beds, grass, they'll find somewhere that they like. It depends probably more on the sun exposure and the soil than anything that we can do to them. Certainly it seems to work well. Uh, they like uh, parts of the lawn and um, even here, um, yes, they nest uh, successfully. Hatchling turtles uh, like the one on the left uh, are found every so often. Of course, you can see from the size, they disappear in a clump of grass at a moment's notice. So they're very hard to find, but they are there. If you do come across a nest and often you, by May, you see test nests and you know that there's a turtle trying to find the right spot for a nest. With a bit of luck, you'll actually figure out where that nest will be located and then Nest protection is definitely something you can do. This little grid here on the clover is simply a piece of a little uh, storage unit. It's a, a metal frame mesh. It's a foot by a foot uh, square. You just pin it down with a couple of uh, plastic pegs and it put, stops any fox or raccoon or anything digging down to get to that nest. 
Um, it's probably not 100% foolproof, but if it works 98%, uh, perfect. And it doesn't need to stay there for the entire nesting uh, incubation duration for uh, the nest. As soon as a couple of good rain showers have gone over it and the scent of the female nesting there has been washed away and has been taken over by other scents from the environment, then after a week, two weeks, three weeks, depending on how much rain has come through, you can remove that grid and continue as if nothing happened. Uh, just be careful by your August, September, as and when the hatchlings may start appearing. What you can also do, which I believe definitely helps uh, the turtles as well as a lot of other wildlife, is creating foraging and retreat areas. Uh, blackberry tangles are a superb uh, fortress to keep uh, predators uh, away from smaller animals. Uh, mulch is also pretty good for them to dig in. And I like to uh, take retired Christmas trees in early January and to put those out. Um, what you can see on the right there is I use a couple of them as a ring around a magnolia that uh, is uh, there. Uh, the deer insist on uh, scraping the velvet of their uh, developing antlers in fall. And apparently that magnolia is just nice and flexible enough that it's good to uh, clean developing antlers, uh, which unfortunately damages the magnolia. So I have to keep the deer away. And I do that by putting this protective ring of old Christmas trees around it. And it seems to work. But it also creates uh, a great shelter area for the box turtles, snakes, and other animals. Likewise, uh, very low growing junipers also do that, uh, create really good uh, shelter areas. Uh, the little white thing there is one of my dogs, who Elsie, who is fascinated by turtles. She just wants to sniff them and stare at them for half an hour at a time. Um, she started digging under this little juniper and when I started looking, like, what have you found there? There was this little uh, year and a half uh, box turtle that you see on the right, just happily tucked in under there, perfectly safe from anything. Because uh, if you've tried putting your hands into one of those low junipers, you know, all those uh, leaves are essentially like needles. Very good fortress, very protective. Um, the other thing I love doing is uh, creating compost uh, stations. Uh, uh, this one here is a combination of old tree trunk sections uh, stacked into a wall and then stack up garden waste and other compost, uh, compostable materials against it. Um, if turtles want to use that to hibernate it uh, in there, great. Uh, snakes probably do so. Certainly the snakes come in in summer and put their eggs in there. Um, so. Uh, compost heaps and brush piles on soft soils can create excellent uh, um, wildlife habitat. Here's another view of how quite substantial some of these composting stations can become. And wildlife certainly appreciates the opportunity and the diversity of uh, hiding spaces that it produce, provides. As I mentioned before, uh, eastern box turtles tend to be edge species. They're not quite closed forest species. They're also not wide open uh, field species. They, they like that tangly, tall, herbaceous uh, um, vegetation, forest edge, nice variety of uh, microhabitats. And so we can do that in a garden as well. I refer to it as uh, uh, prairie areas or flower meadows. See, this is what we bought in 2012. This is a couple of years later from the exact same spot. Um, all it takes is a packet of native wildflower seeds. All you do is mow it once a year in winter when, after, when the soil is frozen solid and there's minimal wildlife hanging out there. And that's all you need to do. The rest of the year, just let it grow wild. You have to do, you have to check with your homeowners association and your neighbors though, if they would object to you letting the place go rather rampant and wild. But when you explain it, they'll 
almost certainly are all in favor of it. So my neighbors love the, the flower meadow that uh, we have produced here. Another thing we can do to help our box turtles is plant things that are useful as food for them. Uh, blackberry tangles uh, produce not only great shelter, but also excellent uh, blackberries that once fallen are great food for box turtles. The wild strawberries that uh, grow all over uh, the region here, again, excellent fruit for uh, box turtles. Various other plants and weeds, and of course, all the invertebrates that are associated with this low herbaceous vegetation, uh, preferably the, the native plants. Of course, also fungi and mushrooms, a favorite uh, uh, food item for a lot of box turtles when for the right species and when available. It's hard to tell from this picture, but if you look at the mouth of this male box turtle, you can see little bits of white just around its mouth on the orange. Those are lamellae of a mushroom that was happily demolishing there. Of course, worms are an excellent food for box turtles. They love that. And worms also aerate the lawn and the flower beds. And again, worms don't like chemical fertilizers as much as far as I you can see on my walks around the neighborhood. So a good reason not to be too aggressive with uh, the lawn chemicals and just let nature take its course and let the worms do the aeration for you rather than some machine. Uh, slugs are also an excellent uh, food source for box turtles. Um, so again, encourage your slugs. Don't use slug pellets. If you want to encourage slugs, plant hostas. Uh, the hostas are the best slug food around. They also are appreciated by yeah, the periodical cicadas, as you can see here, as well as the deer. And this is one, that same hosta bed uh, when a couple of deer had come through. I don't mind. I like my hostas. They'll bounce back. And it, as long as the deer eat the hostas, they don't eat something that's more important. So um, the best thing we can do for our box turtles is really create a variety of microhabitats and let them select what they like to uh, use. Have direct food plants, but also what I consider indirect food plants, feed the invertebrates and the other prey that they like. And of course, native plants are preferred for any gardening. And then also for mulching and weeding of different pockets of the garden. Don't be too tidy. Just leave a few rough areas for the, the wildlife to hang out in. So when you start gardening for wildlife like that, you start thinking about what is the actual design and how do you maximize your opportunities? And how do you do that in the suburban expectations where Essentially, you have to deal with the homeowner the association rules. Uh, um, you have your neighbor's expectations. The neighborhood needs to remain looking good and so on. So my approach has been to have lawn and ornamental flower beds up front. And that can be as outrageous as you want with bananas and <laughs> colorful exotic things. But then have the native wilderness at the back of the house where nobody can see it. The other thing to keep in mind when you're taking uh, selecting plants for a wildlife garden is that a lot of gardening plants are species. A lot of them are selections, which is essentially a particular nice individual of a wild species or plant was selected by somebody and propagated further, like it was extra big, it had extra big flowers, etc. That's a selection, but that's still the wild species in a way. And so it still produces flowers with the pollen, the stamen, the nectar, and so on. However, a lot of garden plants also are hybrids that were created for extra, extra vigor or new color combinations in the flowers and so on. Hybrid plants often lose the ability to um, reproduce. And in the case of plants, that then means that they're not producing pollen, they're not producing nectar, and so they're of no use as food plants for insects and other wildlife. So if you're aware of this and you have a choice between uh, selections and species versus hybrids, go with the species and the selections and avoid the hybrids. 
So again, this is what uh, some of that prairie and flower meadow stuff looks like. Um, just it's one of the nicest things to me that you can do with an area, just return it to to nature, to flowering and to wildlife. But when you're doing that, you also have to work a balance uh, because yes, you're attracting box turtles to optimal habitat, but it also needs to be safe habitat and it maybe it's safe in your garden, but you have to avoid luring those turtles to get close to or into unsafe habitat. And that includes things like roads or the neighbor's lawn where there's a lawn surface running around uh, like Formula One carts every week and running over everything available. So it's got to be, you have to be careful and not uh, uh, just avoid unintended consequences. And some of that you have to create barriers and passages. Um, that includes deflecting box turtles away from danger areas and with danger areas, areas I think of things like vegetable plots where they can get entangled in protective mesh netting or deep swimming pools where they can drop in and no longer uh, escape and drown. Certainly keep them away from roads if possible and again neighbors if they don't have a uh, uh, equally wildlife friendly uh, garden maintenance. But then you also may have to create barriers to deflect dangers away from the box turtle habitat that you have created. Those railway ties there gardening uh, timbers had to be put in to stop uh, my neighbor's yard surface from running into my place. So what you see there is that they're not adjoining perfectly, they're staggered so that a box turtle can actually walk around and get through the gaps and get into safe uh, tall grass. They'll, they're going to avoid being in that um, short grass exposed uh, um, in the short grass, uh, they will prefer to be in the taller grass. So uh, they will happily move there. But if they need to be, uh, if they need to go past that barrier, they can. If you want to do some uh, gardening that really needs to be protected uh, or vegetable gardening or so, I'm a great, great believer in raised beds. Uh, it's um, not only does it keep a lot of ground level animals uh, or um, create a good ground level separation between the wildlife as well as what you want to grow in the raised bed. It also means that you have a, a different soil mix with probably much better drainage and therefore much better productivity if you use that raised bed for the vegetables or even flowers. Peter, Paul, I, I, I'm mindful of the time here. I want yep. to make you aware that, yep, it's five of. Okay, and I am, I think about five slides away. So thank you, good. So again, um, when thinking of gardening, runoff and erosion control is important. Um, so some of the, the good habits are to define walking paths, stay, keep them clear so that you see where you're walking and stay on them. That way you don't compact the soil and you don't step on things that are trying to stay off the path. What I've also done is essentially impose a, a voluntary digging ban. I don't want to be digging around in the garden in anything that could be a nesting area like plant beds or anything. Anytime that there could be turtle eggs or snake eggs or whatever in uh, flower beds or anywhere. So that means no digging, no transplanting plants from mid-May to October. And pretty well the same goes for the composting station. Uh, in summer, the composting areas are used for um, snakes and other animals nesting in there. In winter, they are used for hibernation by animals from insects to snakes to uh, uh, small rodents. And so in winter, you can't mess around in the compost station. You, in summer, you can't. All you can do is in late spring, when everybody has left from hibernation, as well as in early fall, you can 
start digging it down and sieving and processing the compost. But the rest of the year, unfortunately, all you can do is add stuff to the top, but not disturb the body of the composting. So box turtles have a lot of impacts. They have a lot of problems. They have a lot of challenges, but at the same time, there's a lot we can do to help them. And I'm convinced that with a bit of care and with a bit of attention, we can make our backyards and county parks and other protected areas and green spaces suitable habitat for box turtles for generations to come. So I thank you for that and for this opportunity. And among all the others I have to thank, Above all, I have to thank my little dog, Elsie, who is really good at finding turtles for me and let me know where they are. So far, she finds about three to every one that I find. Thank you. Well, thank you, Peter Paul. Lots of good information. Um, I'm sure we're all itching to get to our gardens. Really appreciate <laughs> that talk. Um, if you have time for a few questions, we've got some interesting ones. The, the first one I'd like to start with is, um, we've all heard this, can you, can you tell the age of a turtle by counting the rings on its scoots? Yes and no. You can for the first couple of years of its life, if it's a species that grows up in an area with a very strong seasonal climate. So here in the mid-Atlantic, the box turtles, yes, you can see, count the rings um, and you, it is going to be pretty accurate for the first 10, 15 years, maybe. The trick is that turtles grow until they reach maturity. And then that growth slows down massively uh, because they're putting all their resources into producing eggs or running around trying to find females. So they don't grow that much anymore after sexual maturity. And so the little bit that they grow creates ultra, ultra fine lines together right at the edge of the skews, and those are not possible to count with certainty. You can put it under a microscope, you can make an educated guess, but at some point these animals just start stop growing. And so whereas you can say like, yeah, that's a five-year-old animal with pretty good confidence. You can say that's a 12-year-old animal, probably. That's probably a 15-year-old animal, but that animal over there is 20 years or older, and it could be 20 years, it could be 50. Got it. Thank you. Another question. Joe's asking, where do you look for box turtle nests? If he wants to find one, where does he look? Oh, I don't think that's possible. Uh, I certainly wouldn't know how to look for them. I, it's just, I go around, I say, hey, somebody has been digging here. And if it, after a while you get, you know what a fox hole, what it looks like when a fox is digging, when a squirrel is digging, or when a turtle is digging. There, there's subtle ways of how the, the clay is molded and so on. But uh, essentially, I come across nests by coincidence. I can't go out looking for them. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I think this is from Linda Salozzi, who's a great friend of box turtles, turtles in general. Thank you, Linda. Um, she would like to remind people that um, wildlife rehabbers do fix up turtles. So if you find one um, hit by a car or chewed on by a dog or um, lawn mowers, those are the big three that we see and the doctor um, has mentioned all three of them. Um, do feel free to bring it to a wildlife rehabber. We have turtles, um, but the one thing we're gonna, any wildlife rehabber will ask you is where did you find the turtle so we can get them back home. And um, Another question that I swear is not a plant. Someone asked, does city wildlife treat box turtles? Well, thank you for that question. And Dr. Chuljin, are you still on? And would you like to unmute and take this question or would you wanna throw it back to me? Dr. Chuljin is our veterinarian here. I saw that she was on earlier. Hi, yeah, I am on. I'm also joined by my cat. So if there's meowing in the background, I apologize. Uh, yeah, we definitely treat turtles, um, box turtles and snapping turtles, common snapping turtles are the most common ones that we see. We do see some sliders also occasionally, um, but box turtles are by far our most common species that we see um, largely for incidences of trauma in the city, hit by cars, chewed on by dogs, hit by lawnmowers, hit by weed whackers, um, uh, occasionally chewed on by rats and mice if they're really small. But yeah, we treat several every year. We currently actually have four in the hospital. 
Okay, wonderful. Yeah, and we we see the same thing. Um, our turtles would um, would second um, Peter Paul's assessment of the the dangers out there. That is, in fact, why we get them in. Um, and Linda again is is asking for some kind of new protocol in place to help the species before it's too late. I don't know, but we should all be aware of of any legislature that that um, saves habitats, turtles or otherwise, and do our best to support those efforts. It takes a long time to make a forest. It takes a long time to make natural habitat, and um, um, but it can be destroyed in just a matter of days. So we have to be out there fighting. And City Wildlife does its share of it, but of course we do it in the district primarily. Um, wherever you are, watch for these battles, lend your voice, write some letters, make some calls put out a yard sign, whatever. It will pay off, turtles will thank you, and so will, um, will the other wildlife that lives there. And um, speaking of thank yous, big thanks to Mel, who must be exhausted. Um, Mel joins us for all of these. We are so pleased to have her help. Um, and a special big thanks to um, Dr. Peter Paul Van Dyke, honored to have your assistance, honored to have your knowledge. Everybody learned a lot. I will put this, um, um, the link to this recording on our website within a few days. So check back if you'd like to watch it again, or if you wanna share that with some of your friends who couldn't be with us tonight, but are concerned about turtles. Um, so with that, thank you everyone for coming. It's 8.04, we're going a little bit over, but not much. Big thanks to Peter Paul Van Dyke, Mel, and to everyone who joined in. We'll see you for the next one. I think in April, we have one coming up on beginning birds birding. Um, so watch your email boxes for that. If you're interested in starting bird watching, we'll have a webinar to help you out. So good night all. Thanks again, doctor. Thank you all. Um, if we, can we take a few minutes? I saw two more questions there. Oh yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, Don asked any specific plants to recommend for turtle habitat. I think it's the turtles are happy as long as it's it's a good vegetation as it provides a variety of micro habitats. Um, I mentioned uh, wild strawberries. I mentioned blackberries. There's a couple of other things, uh, but it's probably not critical what it is. More the structure is is probably more important than the individual plant species. And then uh, Lauren asked, well, how might you go about creating a shallow pond in your yard? What materials could you use? Would this attract mosquitoes though? Um, creating a wildlife pond is, we can talk a week about that, uh, which you won't do. I think most garden centers will help you along the way quite a bit. Uh, it can be either a preformed plastic pond or it can be uh, something uh, shaped with a hollow lined with butyl rubber. Um, I would go the butyl rubber route, but either way. Uh, the key is in lots of planting in there. And then as regards the mosquitoes, my... Um, solution to that uh, because I have got a couple of water features out back here is I go to the PetSmart and I buy a couple of the seven cents uh, feeder minnows and release those in uh, the water features and they eat the mosquitoes not the mosquito inside it's the best 70 cents you'll ever spend in the year all right I think that about wraps it up maybe I Double check, make sure I didn't miss any more questions. I did miss those. I'm glad you caught them, doctor. Thanks so much. That's uh, all I could see. Yep, I think that's great. I think we're good. So we'll see you um, the next time we do this. Thanks again, Mel. Thanks again, Peter Paul. Appreciate it much. Great talk. Thank you and good night. Good night. <laughs>